Folks, this is part D of Perspectives on the High Performance Computing in a Big Data World. I'm Jeffrey Fox, who gave this presentation at HPDC on June 27th in Phoenix, Arizona. So, now we come to um, discuss uh, the last part of ML around HPC, which has aspects of learning module details with some really non-trivial examples of agents and time series, data assimilation and things like that. Really quite exciting. So this is sort of represented with our usual picture here. These things here at the beginning are sort of meant to look a bit messy because they're not just point particles, but agents, as you would get if you were doing, a, say, a, a virtual tissue simulation where every point was really a cell with lots of internal structure. Um, here there's a way you can really get a big factor from this idea of surrogates. If you just make the surrogates for each agent, In the, each agent has a surrogate, they're all, and actually each agent is an instance of the general agent or cell model. And as you could potentially have hundreds to millions of such, um, billions of such agents in the, in the overall tissue, then you can you gain this whatever performance gain you got, which we saw was pretty big. You gain it on every on all those agents. So it's an enormously valuable thing to do. Otherwise, each agent has to be simulated. Um, so this is um, can be thought of as ML around HPC for the agents, but it's actually auto tuning for the cellular <coughs> simulation. Uh, sorry, tissue simulation because it's defining the initial configurations to be a, a much more efficient way of simulating cells. Um, another example which has actually been explored quite well in the literature is effectively sort of represented on the, both in, in the software and on the simulation because it involves a very multi-scale work in calculating effective potentials representing the sum of multiple particles in this case. This is a very um, well-established form of study. Um, the use of machine learning has been looked at quite a lot, but it's not a, still right, uh, relatively near the beginning of its study. We can also learn in socio-technical simulations inter interaction graphs, and it um, is a very important way of systematizing these um, um, these type of simulation for doing multi-scale work and having cost grading. All right, so the next example we have here is also very exciting, data assimilation. That's a well-established process where you use the data to correct the simulation as well known for, say, weather forecasting, where your radar data or other observations is fed into the simulation and it effectively um, corrects for unknown science or incorrect initial conditions and things like that. So it uh, produces far more reliable simulations. And we can, we believe you can actually do the same thing on a, as a viewing the simulation as a time series and feeding in data at each step of the time series. This is actually done already not for um, fundamental simulations or in this case here, example we're going to give a biology simulations, virtual tissues, but it's done for right hailing. And the right hailing work has a spatial structure, which is represented by a convolutional neural net because it's graph, graph, and a time structure, which is represented by these long short term memory LSTMs. And it gives pretty reliable answers. And we believe that we, that we should extend these ideas to do uh, the integration of biology data. Because in biology, we have lots of these videos. Well, video is just a time series. With a, high, with a high dimension, you have the position dependence at each time, so maybe that of individual cells. And you have lots of these uh, experimental videos, which can be incorporated into the simulation to learn both the, uh, improve both the current simulation and also to improve the model that produced the simulation, because you can feed it back to give a better model. 
Here is actually the results uh, from Yan Lu at USC at the ICML 2019 time series workshop, which was only a couple of weeks before the, uh, this uh, HBDC conference. Uh, it turns out that uh, some of the largest amounts of data in this area come from right hailing. Uh, they only have, uh, they have over 30 million data points in this particular study coming from Shanghai and Beijing. Um, uh, this, I think, all comes from Didi, the Chinese version of Uber. And uh, they show that by putting in the um, graph, which was the um, convolutional network in space, they can get much better answers. Because the graph is representing the fact that the, the cars have to go on roads and points are near each other. And it's relevant to know, uh, to correlate the results of things which have similar functions because they're going to have correlations. And um, so here you have the spatial correlation, which is the, the green is their algorithm, and the time of LSTM-based correlation, which is even bigger effect. So this is not directly what we want to do for science, but at least it's encouraging uh, that um, uh, already a potentially relevant results have been found in this um, Mr. This example, I should say, I learned about this from the ML Puff because it's part of the uh, deep learning for time series studies they're doing there. Uh, I should say that we're having a workshop at uh, Big Data, which is in Los Angeles this year, and it's December 9th to the 12th. We're not certain which day yet the workshop is, and we want to focus this on not only streaming systems, but also <clears throat> the challenges of real-time machine learning, which is illustrated by the type of work we just studied. We yeah, actually already had uh, two stream workshops, 2015 and 2016. The progress in the field is illustrated that we did not have any discussion of this type of either for science or for right hailing or in the industry, this type of real-time machine learning at those workshops. Um, well, of course, actually, we need to do everything. And that's what it shows here. All possible things need to be done simultaneously. And <coughs> quite how that's, how that's, what's involved there is not clear. But here we have an example, which we generated by a group led by James Glazier, uh, who's in the engineering department at Indiana University in bioengineering. And he shows here from Andy Samerji, produced this sample. Workbench for computational biology showing the learning agent behavior, that's the replacing the coupled ODEs for cells and reaction kinetic calculations. It has the smart ensembles, because you have to run ensembles to explore the space of an unknown space of parameters. This predictor corrector time series method, and everything is auto-tuned. So this uses not everything, but quite a lot of them. And maybe you can use even more, because we haven't put in learning service for the total system here. So this is, it appears that ML around HPC might enable reliable models of complete organisms, which is of course extremely exciting. ML control is not a focus of this presentation, and I really I don't have much deep to say other than what I've said already. And I, but here this uh, slide um, points out there are really two important areas, experimental control, and perhaps even more importantly, because it's even broader, experimental design. And because uh, you only want to do experimental control when you have a tokamak or something to control. But you want to design a simulation um, campaign, whether or not you have a, a violently sensitive experimental apparatus to control. And so that's especially true in these agent-based cases where the, the, there's a lot of um, difficulty in actually designing the core uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, you have to use the model uncertainty to know how to actually do, if you want to, like in biology, you have to do experiments to uh, to properly develop your model, your theoretical model. And that ML control can be used on that to exploit the uncertainty of the model and use machine learning to see which is the most sensitive experiment to do. So this is an area where further work is certainly going to be necessary. Thank you. Um, well, of course, actually, 
we need to do everything. And that's what it shows here. All possible things need to be done simultaneously. And <coughs> quite how that's how that's what's involved there is not clear, but here we have an example which we generated by a group led by James Glazier at uh, who's in the engineering department at Indiana University in bioengineering. And he shows here from Andy Samerji produced this sample workbench for computational biology showing the learning agent behavior. That's the replacing the coupled ODEs for cells and reaction kinetic calculations. It has the smart ensembles, because you have to run ensembles to explore the space of an unknown space of parameters. This predictor corrector time series method and everything is auto-tuned. So this uses not everything, but quite a lot of them. And maybe you can use even more, because we haven't put in learning service for the total system here. So this is, it appears that ML around HPC might enable reliable models of complete organisms, which is of course extremely exciting.